I was asked to give you three key messages about the goals uh, for doctors and patients with regards to diabetes. And we've heard the numbers. Now, the reason, out of the multitude of slides we could have presented with the numbers, I picked this one. Um, and I, some of the interesting slides I came across when I was looking through the different slide sets we had to our available was that if diabetes was a country, it would be the third largest country in the world. And that's a real significant fact. I mean, all the numbers get lost in all the publications. Now, of those patients, a high number of them uh, lose vision due to diabetic com uh, complications. And the reason I picked this slide out is that it's a range of people. We've got people in the working age group. We've got the over 65 group. We've got younger people being affected. And in this slide, actually, the child here is greyed out as if unaffected. But we all know that that will change if we don't halt the progression of diabetes and make some significant changes at national levels. So more and more of these people will be being, becoming affected in children, including the younger age group. But the difficulty here is that they all come in different shapes and sizes. They're all from different backgrounds, different educational backgrounds, different financial backgrounds, and from different countries. And that makes the challenge all the more difficult. We've also heard that the fear of going blind is a key fear for patients. And we need to use this as a motivator, not only for governments and for significant changes at national level, but also for patients to be aware that it is a risk. We've already heard um, from some of the DR Barometer project, there are patients who have no idea about the impact of diabetes on vision. If 50% are fearful of going blind, we need to reinforce that message and that we can change it. So what are the treatment goals? And these were the three, which are very basic. This is not a high level talk, this is headline talk. We have to prevent visual loss. We have to halt visual loss in patients that have it. And now, over the past decade, we've had the ability to reverse existing visual loss. And that is a significant change but it can't be seen in isolation without prevention, halting, uh, pr occurring prior to it. So let's look a little bit at preventing visual loss. And there are different ways we can approach this. We can approach it by screening and identifying patients at an early stage, and we can approach it through good systemic management of patients. Now, let's just look at screening. Now, screening is a very difficult issue because it varies throughout the world, whether it be opportunistic or whether it be national screening programs. Now, I come from the UK and I'm very fortunate to be in a society where we are in a country where we do have a national screening program. And several of the uh, main uh, drivers of that change in the UK are present this um, uh, weekend and hopefully we'll be able to to get their benefit of their knowledge about the difficulties and barriers of developing a national screening program, but also the benefits from it. So national screening programs now are available in different parts throughout the world, and I've only picked out a, a handful here. Um, but also, you can take these screening programs out to different parts of the world. So in our unit, we're starting to develop a screening program, maybe not on a national scale, but certainly on a regional scale, in Malawi in Africa. And so we've good evidence and we've good uh, pointers from um, previous schemes. We can take these forward and spread them out. They may need to be different in different countries. But what's the benefit of a national screening programme? Well, in the UK, we're starting to see the benefit. So um, what we have is a national registry of partial blindness and severe sight impairment in the UK. And we can interrogate those um, directories and registries over the decades to see whether there's been a change in uh, the etiology causing, uh, causing visual loss. And what we found is that the blindness incidence in the UK over the period that national screening has been brought in has dropped by 3% from 17% to 14% and no longer is diabetic retinopathy in the UK the leading cause of blindness in the working age group. It has been overtaken by inherited retinal diseases. So this is a significant change in the past two decades, which coincides with the introduction of national screening. And it may seem smaller, 3%, but remember, if diabetes was a country 
it would be the third largest country in the world. So a 3% change on those numbers is significant. So we can prevent visual loss with certain interventions. Now let's turn a little bit to systemic management. And there are thousands of publications showing the benefit of HbA1c changes, whether it be the diabetes control and complications trials from nearly three decades ago, whether it's the more recent UK prospective diabetic study, whether it be the ACCORD trial. There are thousands of publications, but a lot of the information and clear messages are lost in the millions of words in those publications. So what I've done with this slide is taken and to show some of the benefit that we see. And what we have is groups of patients with different levels, HbA1c's of 11% down to 7%, and looking at the rate of development of retinopathy. And the reason why I brought this out is that most of our patients that I see in my clinic are never going to be on this green line. There are a range of here, and there are targets both in the uh, Europe, UK, US, and around the world, saying that the target HbA1c needs to be 7%. But we all know that that's almost very, very difficult for the majority of patients. But that's not the message. If you reduce the HbA1c by 1%, you reduce the progression of retinopathy or development by 30%. So if you've got a patient who's 11%, they're never going to get to 7 The The odd one might. But the vast majority of people who come in at this do not get there. But that doesn't matter. That shouldn't be lost in the message. The message is small changes, small stepwise changes will make big difference. So 1% makes a 30% difference. That's a real outcome from a simple change. And I think that's one of the things that's often lost when we're trying to get messages over to patients and to other healthcare providers. And the other thing is, is that once you get down to this lower level, then you don't get any more bang for your buck. You don't get any further benefit. And we see this both for HbA1c and we see it for hypertension as well. But you don't always have to get to the target. You just need to work towards the target. So let's turn to uh, blood pressure control. Now, the HbA1c particularly drives proliferative retinopathy. Blood pressure particularly drives diabetic macular edema, which is the largest cause of blindness in the diabetic patients. So this is taken from the large uh, UK prospective diabetic study looking at 1,200 patients for type 2 diabetes. Uh, and they were randomised in this part of the study to either tight control or less tight control. And you can see tight control wasn't, this was in the time when tight control wasn't really considered. Um, 150 over 85 was this group, but poorly controlled was 180 over 105. So that is, these are major changes. They were followed for eight years, and they found that the two groups actually in the end fell into two major groups. There were a group of patients who were less than about 140 over 80, and a group who weren't effectively. The thing is, if you reach the 140 over 80 target, you get a 35% drop in retinopathy progression. Half the patients losing three lines or worse vision. You halve the amount of laser. Remember, Bora mentioned that laser for diabetic macular edema has been the treatment choice for three decades until the development of anti-VEGF treatments. But in that group, you could halve the amount of laser just by getting the blood pressure down. Now, we all know that HbA1c, getting that down to the target levels is very difficult, and patients get fearful, and physicians get fearful as you get to that risk of um, uh, hypoglycemic attacks as you get lower and lower. But a target of 140 over 80, from my understanding from physicians, is achievable. And if it's achievable, it should be achieved. And if it is achieved, you will reduce the number of people needing laser for their diabetic maculopathy by nearly a half. But how are we doing? We're doing awful. We know we're doing awful. This is the uh, National Health and uh, Nutrition Examination Service from the US. Basically, only half the patients reach the targets, whether it be HbA1c or blood pressure or lipid control. But if you put that group together, only one in five actually meet the target. And this is, this is now. Patients are not meeting the target, and there may be numerous reasons. But as I've said, 
we shouldn't be too disappointed because at least if we're approaching the target, we can significantly get a reduction. But we need to keep pushing. Now, we looked at our own practice to see how our practice, the patients coming through. In, in the UK, we have guidelines. So we're going to have a workshop on protocols and guidelines. Now, we have very clear guidelines in the UK of what targets should be met based on the available evidence. So let's have a look what patients I see. Well, of my type 1 patients I see, on half of them are greater than 9% HbA1c. And 40% of them have uncontrolled blood pressure. That's basically higher than 140 over 80. So we're locally not meeting the, meeting the targets. Now, this may be a very select group because these are patients who end up being referred to a tertiary referral centre for diabetes. But it does highlight the effect that patients walking through my door are generally poorly controlled. Now, so we talked a little about prevention. Let's go to HALT, HALT in vision loss. Well, how can we do that? Well, as we've heard, the last three decades, laser for either proliferative diabetic retinopathy or for diabetic maculopathy has been the standard of care. And then more recently, over the last 10 years, anti-VEGF um, treatment has completely revolutionized the care of diabetic macular edema. And there may be some impact on diabetic retinopathy. There's certainly very good evidence for short-term gain. The long-term gains we still need to be proven. But let's just look at laser for proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And as I say, this has been the standard of care for the last three decades. And prior to the diabetic retinopathy study back in the 70s, patients, by the end of four years, if you presented with proliferative retinopathy, you were blind, irreversibly blind, in 44% of patients. And we've been able to halve that by the introduction of good quality and timely peripheral laser. And this has stood the time for the last three decades. But for macular edema, which particularly affects our type 2 diabetic patients, the world has changed significantly. So for retinopathy, this is still the gold standard. This is still what we provide. For diabetic maculopathy, the world has changed completely. Most of us only do laser for diabetic retinopathy, uh, maculopathy, in a select group of patients now. Um, and we're doing less and less of this and more and more of these injections. And we, nobody in the world of ophthalmology felt that these injections were going to catch on. We all said to the, the, the pharmaceutical companies, yes, this will be great, but there'll be a lot of patients who don't wish to take up. Everybody who has an injection comes back for another injection because they see the benefit. This has completely revolutionized our care. And does it halt visual loss in diabetics? Yes, it does. In diabetic macular edema, if you treat patients with laser, this is from the Vivid and Vista study, which are the pivotal trials of ILEA, the aflibicept molecule, run by Bayer, on, uh, or, or, um, uh, provided by Bayer now, uh, uh, these were the pivotal studies. And if you look at the patients who lost 15 letters, and I'll explain later exactly this loss, but this significant loss of vision, if you have laser in the short period of this study over the first 12 months, 10%, one in 10 patients will lose 15 letters. If you treat them with anti-VEGF treatment, these bars are almost uh, invisible. They are 0.7%. We have halted the visual loss due to diabetes once you've got diabetic macular edema or further loss. But how, can we reverse it? And what does reversing mean? Well, a gain of 15 letters means that if a letter, if you can see this S here and you can gain 15 letters on an ETGRS chart, it means you can see the S when it's this size. What that means is that if you gain 15 letters, you can see things half the size. And the reverse of that is true. If you lose 15 letters, things need to be twice the size. And that's a big impactful thing to get over to patients, that that's what we're aiming. When we're looking, we're talking about getting you from seeing things that are this size to seeing this size. And if we don't treat you, or we have the, if you go ahead with the present situation, you may lose 15 letters. So in a few years time, you may have to have things this size before you can see them. But even small gains, even a five-letter gain, even just one line of improvement in visual acuity has significant impact for patients, both in reading, their ability to drive at night, 
and their ability to drive under difficult conditions such as rain or glare, etc. So small gains make a big difference. Now, in the era of anti-VEGF treatment in diabetic macular edema, one of the pivotal trials was the Rise and Ride trials using monthly injections of anti-VEGF in the form of uh, ranibizumab. And in these two studies, patients were randomized to either receive the injection uh, of two different doses or con continue with the standard of care. And the standard of care was laser. So if you have patients over three years, only till a few years ago, patients did not gain vision. We halted vision loss. Remember, diabetic laser halted vision loss, but you didn't gain vision. The world has now been changed. With anti-VEGF, you can now reverse visual loss and you can get a gain in vision here. Now, the other thing here about this slide is that if you trickle along with laser and then you now get access to anti-VEGF, you never reach the same potential that you would have done if you'd had early access to that treatment. So reversing visual loss is possible in 2018 in a significant number of patients to a significant level of gain in vision, but it has to be provided timely. Patients have to be in. And one of the other things we're seeing is a improvement in the retinopathy, because this is all to do with maculopathy, but we're seeing um, other effects in terms of retinopathy. And we'll talk about two-step improvement in diabetic retinopathy score, and I think David's going to expand on that. But this really shows it, and I, I don't know if it projects particularly well on here, but this is a patient with a, a particular uh, preproliferative diabetic retinopathy. And if they happen to be getting anti-VEGF for their macular edema, they get significant improvement uh, in their peripheral diabetic retinopathy. This wasn't the aim of treatment, uh, but you can see that all the hemorrhages and the cotton wool spots are disappearing as a as a a potential gain from the anti-VEGF because we're giving it for the macular edema. And if you look at the pivotal studies of the Vivid and Vista in the, in the, uh, with regards to Aflibercept and ILEA, what you can see is that patients here, maybe between a third up to 50% of patients, have an improvement in their diabetic retinopathy as well. Now, this is over the short term when they're receiving the injections. So we don't know the long-term benefits of this change in the retinopathy. We do see it with diabetic macular edema, but they need less and less injections, and there's an element of disease modification. You give the anti-VEGF for their edema, and you do, as their edema resolves, they need less and less injections. There seems to be some hardening there. There seems to be some disease modification. Whether that exists for retinopathy with peripheral vessels, we don't know. We know from Protocol S, a large US study, and we know from a large study in the UK known as the Clarity study published in The Lancet, that the short-term gains of anti-VEGF treatment are very good, but the long-term gains we still need to uh, be aware of. So really, to summarize, my three take-home messages is that we can prevent visual loss, we can halt further visual loss, and we can reverse it. We, in prevention, through whether it be national screening programs or any screening programs, along with good systemic management, real targets, we can get real outcomes for these patients. A 1% reduction will lead to a 30% reduction in diabetic retinopathy progression. You don't have to get to seven. One will get you 30%. Halt further visual loss. As long as we get the patients in early, we can prevent blindness. And once the, they have lost vision, we do have the potential in 2018 to reverse that if it's delivered correctly. If we do it too late or we don't do it to the appropriate uh, regimes, we will not get that benefit. But hopefully, as I say, in 2018, we have these. We just need to make sure that we deliver on all three of them. Uh, thank you very much.